today we're fortunate to have Mr. Sanford Sorkin, who is a birding enthusiast and a photographer. He's also treasurer of the Montclair Bird Club, and uh, there's some information about the Bird Club on the table in front of the fireplace in case you think you might like to come. There's some interesting programs coming up there as well, so do help yourself. And he, his topic today is Costa Rica, the beautiful, colorful birds of Costa Rica. And I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Sorkin. Thank you, Lucy. You're welcome. I'm surprised everybody actually went out in the rain today to, to do this sort of thing. I have uh, a lot of bird pictures here, a lot of stuff about Costa Rica. And if you have any questions while I'm going through this, please don't hesitate to ask the question right then and there, because I may not be able to find that picture again. If I know the answer to the question, I'll answer it properly. If I don't know the answer, I will make up something that sounds very credible, and you'll be confident that you know what's going on. Anyway, to get started here, uh, I'm going to try to do a little bit of magic here. I hope everybody is, remembers a bit of their geography and they know exactly where Costa Rica is. Very small country it's compared to some of our smaller states, but there's a lot going on there. It's fascinating. It's uh, in a very interesting spot because if you look down the coast, you can see that we have mountain ranges. And when you have mountain ranges, you have all the varieties of flora and fauna that like low altitudes all the way up to the high altitudes. In the lower left-hand corner, you can see a picture of me holding a newspaper. On one of my trips, one of the volcanoes decided to make a little fuss. And when Terriabla blew, the clouds were in the sky, the airlines canceled flights. And for most of us, we didn't care. It just meant we had a few extra days in Costa Rica. But when people travel there, they usually tell you where they're going with reference to one of the volcanoes. Most of my trips have been around Tiriabla and south, all the way down to Panama. There's a little section down there towards the bottom right that comes off of Costa Rica, that little spit of land there, and that's the Osa Peninsula. That's where I haven't been, but that's where I would like to go. That's where you find all sorts of the endemics, the birds that are only found in Costa Rica. So the first part of this is my quiz. So what is the national bird of Costa Rica? Hummingbird. That's too obvious, no. Oh. <laughs> but you'll get there. <coughs> I'm going to give you four choices. The bird is a thrush. You've got the beautifully named black nightingale thrush. You've got the spectacled thrush, beautiful yellow ring around its eyes. You've got the sooty thrush, clearly named, and you've got the clay-colored thrush. You've got a country, you want something spectacular, you want something that people will remember, which one do you choose? That's what most people say. They went with the clay color. So this is a common, ordinary brown bird that's all over the place, but as pretty as it may be, you've got to wonder why they chose this one, given the variety that they actually have there. When we talk about endemics, First of all, the United States has somewhere between 800 and 900 species of birds. That number is going to go up because they're now starting to include Hawaii in this. And if you take a look at Costa Rica, they have almost as many. The further south you go, by the way, the more varieties of birds you do find. Colombia, Ecuador, they're just filled with birds. And for the hummingbirds, the further south you go, the more variety you find. In this case, though, just to mention the endemics, an endemic is a bird that's only found in your country. So for the United States to have endemics, it's easy. We've got a big country. But when you go to a small country like Costa Rica, you only have a few endemics, birds that are only found there. So a lot of people actually include Panama in the list, and then you have the bigger number at the bottom of the screen. So you have a lot of birds that are just found there. That's good news, that's bad news. The more uh, area that they cover, the larger the distribution, the less likely they are to suffer from 
climate change and all the other hazards that befall all of these birds. But when they chose the clay-colored thrush, they didn't choose the bird that most people go to Costa Rica to see, and that's the resplendent Quetzal. It's up close on the left. I've got a bigger picture on the right, and it's a spectacular bird. What may not be clear from this picture is that if the base of that bird's tail was on the floor, its head would be up about here. It's huge. And uh, it's amazing to see, and it absolutely gets in the way of everything, as you might expect. But the resplendent Quetzal, it's mentioned in the mythology of Central American countries. Uh, it's actually the national bird of Guatemala, and it's actually found on a lot of the currency down there as well. But I like these birds that are spectacular, and you've got to wonder why they are the way they are. Well, obviously, the female of the species likes this bird the way it is. There's one flying away with a berry in its mouth. That's the picture everybody wants to get, flying away. And that's what the female looks like. So you'll see some pictures later on of trogons, and this is the family that this bird is in. And uh, the female sits there and the male sits there. They feed on the almond trees. And uh, again, they're wonderful to see. And people do travel from all over the world just to see this one bird. The fork-tailed flycatcher is another pretty cool bird that's down there. The, the good news and the bad news is it's a beautiful bird. I love to try to take pictures of it. The problem is these birds tend to want to be on wires. And I really don't want pictures of birds on wires. I want pictures of birds on branches, doing something. And every now and then you get lucky and you'll find that they actually sit there and they wait for you to take a picture. This one, and it'll make a little difference later, this flycatcher is in the kingbird family. So we have kingbirds up here. You'll see some others down there. The rufous-tailed jacamar, one of my favorites. One peculiarity of this bird is that it sits on a branch and it looks and surveys the area. When it sees an insect, goes out and grabs it and comes right back to the same place. It also look for butterflies. It likes to eat butterflies, but it only likes to eat butterflies that are of a certain shape. So if it's the wrong shaped butterfly, it'll fly right by. Otherwise, it jumps off, grabs it, eats it. And the other neat thing, if you're a photographer, is that this bird doesn't really care about you. As long as you don't get closer than, say, seven feet, this bird won't care. It'll just sit there and do its thing and eat, and it's... Uh, always coming back to the same place so you can set up your camera and be ready for it all the time. The Costa Rican pygmy owl comes in a couple of different colors. This is the rufous one and it's a very small bird and it's partially diurnal so it's out in the daytime so from a photography perspective that's really a good thing. It's also a bird that's monogamous. Now speaking primarily to a women's club, I assume you all know the definition of monogamous. <laughs> but in the bird world, it doesn't mean what you think it means. It means that the male is probably going to hang around in some way to help out with things, maybe feed the young, maybe even help incubate the young. But it's got very, very little to do with sex. The birds are very active and it is highly unlikely that the male in the pair is actually raising his own young. Some other males helping out someplace else. But the males and the females go about their business all the time. The other thing, which is probably worth mentioning here, when the male meets the female and they decide that the, the female stays there, is ready, and the male wants to go have some sex with the female, the whole process takes maybe a second or two to fly to where she is, a little less time for sex, and then another two seconds to get back to where he was, and that's the end of it all. <laughs> but anyway, the owls are pretty neat. There are a lot of them, and it's fun to see them. The sun grebe is another very interesting bird. I took the picture from the back here so you can see the colors of this bird, and the really neat thing about it is its feet. 
So if you have seen uh, moorhens and other birds like coots that have these lobed feet, that's what this bird has. It's in a very, very small family of birds. There are only three birds in the family. One in Costa Rica, or Central America, I should say. The other one's in India, and the third one's in Africa. And that's the whole family of these birds. So the theory is, of course, at some point in time, when all the continents were together, or much, much closer, that's when these birds were closer. Continents split, each one got their own bird. So the sun grebe is pretty good to photograph, but they also behave like anhinga. Now the anhinga, if you're not familiar with it, is also called a snake bird, and it's a very tall bird with a very long pointed beak, and if you're in Florida particularly, you see them walking around in lakes, but you don't see the bird, you just see his head coming out of the water like a periscope. These aren't nearly that size, but they will do the same thing. The smooth-billed Annie is another really interesting bird. I like them. There's a groove build. There's a smooth build. This one got very wet, and he's now just hanging out to dry his wings for a bit. But when you see these birds, you very rarely see one. They're usually in groups, and in the morning, if you go outside, you'll see groups of them all huddled together on a wire. I don't know if it's just comfort or warmth or what it is, but they're out there together. But these birds also do something which is very, very interesting, and that is they will share all the responsibilities for incubating and feeding the young. But it goes beyond just the pair that had the young. The other birds will help out. So in this particular case, the birds, the females, will lay eggs often in the same nest. So one nest will have the eggs from a number of females, and then the families stay there, and they all incubate, they all feed, and they all help out. And if they have two broods, the first group will come back and help to feed the second group. I should have another picture of these guys. But there he is again, and uh, just sitting on the top of the leaf. It's amazing how light these birds actually are, but if you have to fly, that's a good thing. They all, almost every bird I'll show you here is busily eating anything it can find. Some of them are just frugivores and are just eating fruit, but most of them will eat lizards, insects, fruit, anything they can actually get a hold of. We also, oh, I'm sorry. Is that a bill or a beak? I'm going to make up one of those answers that's going to sound very credible. <laughs> They're the same thing. <laughs> I don't know that there's a difference between a bill and a beak. Normally, when you describe these birds, you do describe them with bills. But I can't think of an instance where anybody has ever made a distinction that I'm aware of. Though if I'm talking about a bird that looks like that, or a parrot, I'm going with beak. But I don't really know if there is a, a difference there. You may recognize that one. That's the female Baltimore Oriole, but it might not be the female. It could be a young one. The uh, Baltimore Orioles don't grow into their colors for a couple of years. So that is most likely a, a young male, Baltimore Oriole. There's another one which you find locally as well. That's the Orchard Oriole. And it's only called an Orchard Oriole because people were very confused when they first discovered this bird, and they thought it actually was from the female, the same as the Baltimore Oriole. But at the other one, this one's actually named after a bird in, in the old world, it's from Europe. But when you get down to Costa Rica, you'll find some more Orioles. There's the black cowed Oriole, and it behaves pretty much the uh, way our Orioles behave. And it's uh, looking for fruit, or it will eat its insects. The collared red start, we don't have those up here yet, but the collared red start is a fun little bird. Very difficult to photograph because it wants to follow you. So if you've got a telephoto lens and your interest is getting a bird way over there, this one wants to be around your knees. You probably are, you've heard of cowbirds. Yeah. Now, cowbirds are parasitic birds that follow cows. They follow herds of anything because when the cows walk around, 
they knock insects up into the air. They scare the insects, they go up in the air, the birds eat them. This bird behaves exactly the same way. So it follows people, and as you're walking in the grass and you kick it around a little bit and insects fly up, they're right in there to, to grab them. The tropical perula are just beautiful colors. We have a regular perula here in the States, and the coloration is very, very similar, and the birds are very, very similar. They can hybridize. So the tropical perula, it likes these woody vines. It likes this kind of an area. Then we move into euphonia. These are smaller birds. They eat fruit. They eat insects. And just generally delightful little things. But the next bird I'm going to show you is not this bird. See if you can pick out the difference. Okay? Yellow-crowned euphonia, thick-billed euphonia. Most people don't see the difference right away. Yellow ones heavy. A little bit. There's a big, big difference. The colors are different. Take a look at the chin. And there are a lot of these, a lot of different varieties. Now, this one spends a lot of time eating good old holiday berries. So the white berries that we get, if you remember all the mistletoe berries that we see, and all of the tales about how mistletoe is poisonous, yeah. it isn't. That's what these birds like to eat. There's the female, looks quite a bit different. And now we have the ruddy ground dove. So if you like pigeons and doves, personally I think this one is beautiful. And it's uh, everywhere. And they are spreading north, so that we now do see them Florida and our southwest. But it's, a, again, a bird that's, uh, it does very, very well. The meadowlark, red-breasted meadowlark. The first time I went to Costa Rica, that was not a red-breasted meadowlark. It was a red-breasted blackbird. But with all the genetic testing that people do, it turns out it's a meadowlark. So its name got changed. And it tends to sit on posts. It behaves just like the meadowlarks that you may or may not see around here because they are diminishing numbers. But it's a bird that sits up there. It sings. It makes all of its uh, wonderful sounds. And... In some instances, when we clear woods and forest, we take away habitat from birds. This one actually likes it. So it thrives in these open areas. We move a little bit into the hummingbirds. And the fiery-throated one is found in Costa Rica. That's one of the endemics. The little one going towards it on the other side is a volcano hummingbird. One of the neat things about these hummingbirds is they are tiny, but they can be vicious. They protect their flowers. They protect the feeders. They very rarely will allow another bird to go anywhere near its flower. So they're very peculiar, very uh, territorial is probably the best word here. The fiery-throated, though, interestingly, while it will fend off other hummingbirds, it will allow the female to come in and eat at the same place in the same time. So the couple will actually work out together. Another shot of them. It's really difficult to get those wings still, and I don't really try much anymore. And then we have the long-billed hermit, and the long-billed hermit on the Haliconia is the, the prize picture. It's the one you want to try to take, and if you wait long enough, they come in and they do it. A lot of the hummingbirds, though, are not trying to go in from the top of the flower to get the seeds, they will actually poke holes right in it to get there. There's another shot of the long-billed hermit. And the long-billed hermits are birds that also form leks, L-E-K-S. Lek is a play on a Swedish word for play. And a lek is where the birds go to meet. So it's like a bar. It's where they hang out. So the males or the females go to the lek and the one will sing, and the other, the females will look at them. And in some cases, they want the birds that look good. In other cases, they want the birds that sing very well. But these birds will go to the lek, maybe up to 25, 
and do their singing and hope to be picked up, I guess is the best way to describe it. Now the lek is typically a cleared area on the ground and if you watch the National Geographic specials, you'll see that lots of birds do some very, very fancy things with the lek. The violet-crowned wood nymph, it's uh, another one that's just a beautiful bird. The males tend to eat way up in the canopy, the females down a lot lower, so I've never seen them together. And quite honestly, I don't know that I could tell them apart. The rufous-tailed hummingbird is one of the more common ones, and that also is a very, very territorial bird. They are very aggressive. The next one, Talamanca, I have to look at the name because I never remember it, because when I took the picture, that's not what it was called. It used to be called the Magnificent Hummingbird, but they decided that Talamanca is the one you see in Costa Rica, Magnificent is what you would see north in Nicaragua. Interestingly, as you look at all these birds, if you try to pay attention to what you've seen and you label your pictures, they do change the names quite a bit. This one is now the lesser violet here. It had another name when I took the picture, but uh, again, fun to watch them go up there and get all of the nectar out of these flowers. The other thing about the lesser violet here is it is one of the smallest birds, being a hummingbird, there are some smaller, and this I always find curious. The books will tell you that it has weak feet, so it will never be seen walking on the ground. Have you ever seen a hummingbird walking on the ground? They always show them feeding and flying and moving around, extremely agile. I've never seen any of them walk. But this one actually flies at speeds up to 90 miles an hour. That's pretty fast. Another group which I love to look at are the coquettes. The, this one is the white-crested coquette, and it's the female. The male is, I'd love to see one, I have not seen one yet, but it's a delightful little bird. And if you're a photographer, when the bird comes to feed, it will hit a bloom, and it will go around the plant clockwise. So you know exactly what it's going to do, you can be ready for it. The white-tailed, oh, there's the other picture of the coquette. And the white-tailed emerald, though, is one of the smallest birds in existence. So maybe it's, I'm not doing it justice by having it up here on the big screen. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the white-necked Jacobin, which is a very large hummingbird. And uh, they normally hang out in the trees, but if you have a feeder, they will come right into it. Another small one is the charming hummingbird. And again, it also forms leks where the, the males and females go to, to get together. Then we have, along the rivers, the kingfishers. In the US, we typically just see our belted kingfisher up here. But as you go further south, you'll see other varieties. The kingfisher here, the Amazon kingfisher, is a fairly large bird. And it builds nests in the riverbanks. So it will tunnel into the bank one and a half meters. So it's going in almost four to five feet into the bank to actually create its nest. A smaller one is the green kingfisher, and we do see this one coming north as well. They typically go out, fly up and down the rivers, find a fish, grab it, bring it back again pretty much to the same place to eat, so you know where to find them as well. Another shot of the green, and I'm showing you multiple pictures of the same bird because the colors vary so much, especially depending on the light that you have when you take the picture. Flame-colored tanager. It's uh, just as, as spectacular as you think it is. And the sound it makes is very much like the, the peeping sound that the cardinals make here. Another up close and personal. And there he is in the rain. It's funny how we, we look at birds quite often from other places and go, aren't they beautiful? Aren't they colorful? But keep in mind that we have similar variety here in the US. There's an awful lot to see. And some of the things that we may think of as being common, like our blue jays here, those are spectacularly colored birds. And a lot of people are excited to see them. 
another tanager, silver-throated. You'll either see a pair of them or you'll see a flock of them. And you can pretty much figure out where they got their name. Flame-colored warbler. Now, flame-colored warbler presents a bit of a problem because with all of the genetic testing that takes place, it probably isn't a warbler. So for all of its existence, it's been called a warbler, and it's quite possible that uh, the next time I do this presentation, somebody will tell me it's a tanager. There's a tanager. A common one, again, but the golden-headed tanager is a very attractive bird, and it's another one of the birds where if it has two clutches of birds in the season, the first group will come back to help take care of the second group. There he is with a berry. Gray-headed tanager, sometimes our bird naming conventions aren't as creative as they might be. And How big is the bird? It's a, a little smaller than a robin. And then the blue-gray tanager. Now, I can tell you that that's a blue-gray tanager. And I very confident that it's a blue-gray tanager. Really no issue in my mind whatsoever. It's a very common bird. You see a lot of them. But it turns out there are somewhere between, between 13 and 15 species of this bird. And the only variation between the species is the amount of blue. So there are some experienced birders out there that know what they're doing and they can tell you which one it is. I'm not one of them. All I know is it's a blue bird. But the hue makes a difference. And again, it's a tanager, so it would be the same size as the other tanagers that I've shown you. Speckled tanager, they like fruit. You know how I know? Those are bananas on the table where the bird flew in. The palm tanager doesn't seem to be too concerned about people. They pretty much like the blue-gray tanager, so they will go right in to any place that you happen to be, and they will uh, just hang out, eat, and do their thing. Summer tanager. That one you may have seen here. I mean, they're common in the U.S. as well, but again, it's a bright blue bird that is frequently mistaken for the cardinal, though it doesn't have a crest. And there are some other birds that are similar, uh, but it's a red wing, it's a red bird. Another view of the summer tanager. Crimson collared tanager. The varieties are endless here. Cherry's tanager. I think the guy's name was George Terry. Uh, it could be, no, it was George Terry. And in around 1913, he accompanied Theodore Roosevelt when they went to the River of Doubt, which is now the Rio Roosevelt. And this is one of the birds that they found. Cherry's tanager is this black bird with the red behind it. That's the female. Doesn't look anything like the male. But the only reason I know that that's a Cherry's tanager is because the female's with it. If the female wasn't with it, I wouldn't know. Because there's another bird, Passerini's tanager. And they are almost, not almost, they are identical. It's very, very few people would ever be able to tell them apart. Mostly you can tell them apart because one's on the east side of the range, the other's on the west side of the range, but it will probably be grouped into one family when they start renaming the birds this year. Over there on the right-hand side, we've got an emerald tanager. That is the only one I have ever seen. But keeping along with tanagers, we have bayheaded. And the bayheaded, I think, have beautiful coloration. But interestingly, the colors vary dramatically on these birds, especially when you see the young ones where they're coming into their color. There's a younger one. You can see the head is not nearly as red. They love the berries. Now we have a red-throated ant tanager. A lot of the birds that you'll see in Central America and Costa Rica are ant birds. Ant tanagers, ant this, ant that, ant wrens. And it has absolutely nothing to do with eating ants. There are all kinds of varieties of ants. The ones that you want to really stay away from, beyond the ones that just sting like crazy, 
are the army ants. And when the army ants go through any kind of an area, all the insects that don't want to be devoured fly up. So these birds follow the ants. And as the ants make their rounds, insects pop up and they come in and grab them. At night, or in the morning rather, at night you have all the moths that come out. In the morning you might see a moth on a screen, on a window or whatever. These birds are right there to clean them off. The red-legged honey creeper, and we know where it gets its name, got red legs. That's the green honey creeper. But it's not clear where it got its name because that's not green, it's blue. I think that's teal, isn't it? But it's a beautiful bird and up close and personal. But the female is green. It's a beautiful lime green or grass green. So in this instance, the bird was clearly named for the female. In the early days of people going out and trying to identify new flora and fauna, they didn't know which was the male, which was the female, which was young, which was old. And quite often, the names needed to be changed eventually or in this case, doesn't matter all that much. Then we get up to the collared arasari. I've got to give you one big note about the arasari. This year, while I was watching the National Spelling Bee on ESPN, where they ask these kids words that you've never heard of before in your life and I've never heard of before, one of the kids was asked to spell arasari. And I'm going, hey, I can spell that. I even know what it is. <laughs> so anyway. Collared arasari, does it look like that's a jagged, scary bill and if it clamped down on you, it would cut? You'll notice the bill is actually straight and those jagged marks are just the coloration. There's more than one kind of arasari. Those are fairly big birds. They're at least this big. There he is again. You can see a little better. And flying away. In this instance, I decided to cross out the old names. It seems that every year they change the name of this bird. So my black mandibled became a chestnut mandibled, and now it's the yellow-throated toucan. Another shot of them. And there's a keel build. Now, quite often you'll see these birds with great precision pick one berry off of a bush, and they just sort of hold it. These birds will actually play catch with it. And they will throw it to another bird. The other bird will catch it and throw it back. I doubt that they catch it precisely at the tips of their bills, but they do play catch with them. The emerald toucanet, you see small flocks of these, another reasonably large bird. And this is where you get into nature. It's a beautiful bird. I'd love to tell you it's a great one to have around. But if you're trying to preserve the resplendent Quetzal, the bird we saw right in the beginning, the huge long tail. This bird is one of the ones that is a predator that goes after the eggs because it can reach into the nest and take them right out. The toucans, their history is, goes way, way back. They were discovered here when explorers first came to the New World. And they thought that these birds just ate fruit. They will eat anything they can catch. So they will eat other birds, they will eat fruit, they will eat insects, they'll pick up amphibians. So nature does what it needs to do. Yellow-crowned night herons. I'm not sure if you've seen these or not, but if you go over to the Meadowlands, you'll see that we do have some of them there. And these birds are, uh, I guess they're growing in numbers now, but the uh, bird was also imported into England for food. So they've got a population over there as well. I had spent a lot of time looking for these things. I never found one. I went down to Florida to see my brother, and I said, I really would like to see a yellow-crowned night heron. And we turned the corner by this airport, and the whole field is covered with just these birds. The young one that you see, it's only the eye and the legs that tell me that it's a young yellow-crowned night heron because there's another bird that baby looks almost identical to it, and that's the black crown night heron. So I'm not showing you the baby again because it looks the same. Legs are a little different. 
But the black crowns are the ones that are endangered. But we also have those around here as well. And most years you can see these in Edgemont Park. And somebody runs up to you and goes, is that a penguin? And it's like, no, sir, not a penguin. Well, now we're back up in the trees and we have cuckoos. Cuckoos are parasitic birds, like we were talking about the cowbird. They will lay their eggs in other birds' nests and expect the other birds to actually raise their young. It's something that evolved over the years because these are birds that are following food somehow or another, and they don't have time to stay still and actually raise young. So it's up to some other bird to do that for them. In this area, we have a very, very interesting thing because when the cowbirds, for example, lay their eggs in the nest of a warbler, the warbler will raise the young. But every now and then, they lay their eggs in the nests of our goldfinches. And when they do that, the babies all die. Goldfinches are seed eaters. They don't give these baby birds the protein that they need from caterpillars and other insects. The squirrel cuckoo, named a squirrel cuckoo probably because it jumps around in the bushes very much the way a squirrel does, you know, along the branch. Hoffman's woodpecker, a uh, lot of woodpeckers down there. We have uh, much more variety than we do up here. And there are just four of them. Lineated, the hairy woodpeckers, red crowned. The acorn woodpecker, though, is another one that we have here in the States, mostly in the South. And that's the bird that actually pokes lots of little holes in the tree or the post or wherever it is, and it puts acorns in. So I used to, for whatever naive reason, think they would poke a hole and they go get an acorn, which is not what they do. They poke lots of holes and then they go get the acorns because the male and female then have to hang around the tree and defend it from the blue jays who would like their acorns. The picture of the tree in the upper left is not a picture from Costa Rica. It's a picture from our southwest. So the acorn woodpeckers are around. Yellow-bellied Alania, another pretty bird. I don't have a lot to say about all of these birds, but we have osprey down there. Now, there are some varieties, but this is pretty much the same osprey that you're going to see up here. And they fly, they spot a fish, they dive. Just before they hit the water, their claws go out, and the fish is probably not right on the surface. They will go down at least a foot or two if they need to, grab the bird, and then fly away with it. Once they get it up in the air, they turn it around so it's aerodynamic and faces forward and they take it back to the nest. But ospreys get picked on by all the other birds. The picture I didn't get in focus, which I really wish I had, the osprey takes the fish up into the air, the bald eagle comes along, smacks the osprey, knocks the fish out of its claws, dives and catches the fish before it hits the water. And it was not in focus. The sun bitter, that's another bird that people go out of their way to try to catch. And the theory is when it opens its wings like this, if you're lucky enough to be there to get the picture, it looks like eyes. And other birds are going to stay away from this big bird with the big eyes. Probably true, I don't know. But the really neat thing about this bird is it behaves a lot like the green herons that we have up here. It will actually fish for fish. It'll pick up a stick, dangle it in the water to attract the fish, and when the fish comes along, drop the stick, grab the fish. It takes a while to catch one of these things with its wings open. You got to take pictures of flowers. When you do that, you also get the ants. And they're leaf cutter ants. They won't touch a leaf on the ground. They've got to go up a tree, cut the leaf from the tree, go back down the tree, and go back down to their nest. And they are always in wonderful straight lines until they get right in front of the nest, and then they spread out a little bit. And uh, I just find it interesting. They're not birds. The rufous collared sparrow is a high altitude sparrow. It's a very, very common one. And 
it would be the equivalent of our house sparrow here. They're very common. And because it's unusual for us, they're very, very pretty. There's another view of it. The banana quit is another interesting bird for a couple of reasons. Every place we've ever visited, and my wife and I have gone through the Lesser Antilles and we've hit lots of islands down there, every one of these islands has a banana quit. And every one of these islands calls it something else. So they all look pretty much the same, except on one island, when you get down to St. Vincent's, their banana quit's black. All the others are that yellow color. The neatest thing about this bird, though, is you've seen documentaries about the Galapagos Islands and the finches. They're related to Darwin's finches. Another bird that we find up here, Great Kiskadee. It's a tyrant flycatcher. It's one of the largest. Tyrant because they are very, very aggressive and they will defend their territories. And that's a sloth, not a bird again. If you're in Costa Rica, you want to see the sloth. There are three toed sloths and there are two toed sloths. And they're very different. And it turns out they're not even closely related, even though they behave exactly the same way. And every time I look at them, I got this strange notion that three toed sloths, you look at it, you'll see three claws. Turns out they all have three toes. It's further down in the hand where they have different numbers of fingers. So who knew? But anyway, they uh, don't walk very well. They do swim well, and they do climb around just eating leaves. And this picture I was very lucky to get. It may not be as clear as I would like, but that's the mother up in the tree, and that's a baby that's either kissing her or licking her, but just holding the baby. And the baby will hold on, and mom climbs, and they do that for a long, long time. The curacao, another bird that's going to be endangered, probably because it tastes good. The male's got that wonderful yellow knob on it. The female doesn't look anything like the male. I think she's just as pretty in her own way. And while they will forage on the ground, they do spend time up together. These are the curacao in love, up in the nest, up in the tree. Crested guan. This is a bird that you normally don't see walking around on the ground. It's a bird that you normally see up in the trees. And again, it's a bird, it's light, they walk around, and that's where they feed. This bird has one of the great names, a chakalaka. So this is the gray chakalaka, and they are almost always in the trees, in the bushes. They don't come out very often. And then we move into trogons, uh, birds that tend to not want to fly, even though they fly extremely well, but they do spend a lot of time in one place, absolutely motionless. So it's not that difficult to take pictures. There's one trogon I would love to see. I've never seen one, but it's the Cuban trogon. And I think there's some irony in the fact that the bird is red, white, and blue. <laughs> some other trogons, males, females. That's a horse. <laughs> You're in an area where it's a very convenient thing to have a horse. We have the jacana, the northern jacana. The northern jacana walk around on the lily pads. And then we get into mannequins. The white ruffed mannequin, the white collared mannequin. The neat thing about mannequins is if you have no ability to do bird calls, you can attract them because they are attracted to finger snapping. So that will get them in because that's the sound the bird makes with its wings when it's at the lek. They clear an area, there's usually a stick right in the middle, and that's where they do their dance. Just because mannequins are neat, I brought in two more. Those are from Trinidad, though. That's not an ooh. Uh, this is a, a pit viper, and it probably would be very bad to get bitten by these things. I have seen them many, many times, but I've never seen one move. They just sit there. And you stay away from them, you use a telephoto lens, there's no problem. 
The Ferdinands, on the other hand, <laughs> is another story. On Trinidad, they have one of the most venomous snakes in the world, the Ferdinands. So they got smart, and they go, you know, in India, they have cobras, and they get mongoose to kill the cobra. So they import mongoose onto the island. Well, it turns out the Ferdinands is nocturnal. The mongoose is diurnal. So it did nothing to the Ferdinands problem, and now they have a mongoose problem. <laughs> anyway, cinnamon, Bacard, just some pretty flowers. I was trying to photograph a purple gallinule, and it kept diving into the grass, but the flowers looked pretty good. Black Phoebes, which we do have here around our southwest, primarily. And they will fly back and forth, another flycatcher, if you know where they started, that's where they'll probably end up. They stay on their same perches. A lot of hawks, roadside hawk, semi-plumbeous, meaning mostly gray, followed by the gray hawks. I think they're gray hawks, yep. Broad-winged hawk. Now, the big question for you is, have you seen a broad-winged hawk? Because most years, thousands of them fly over Montclair. It's one of the biggest counts you have for migration. Yellow-headed caracara, flowers, bromancia. The fences in Costa Rica are not white picket fences. You cut down a bush, you stick the sticks in the ground, and you get a nice living fence in very short order. Just some of the views, some of the places, Esquinas, a caiman. Again, they are dangerous creatures, but if you're not in the water with them and you don't go after them, they pretty much stay away from people. We have the common toady flycatcher, another common bird. Again, flycatcher, that's what it's eating primarily. Bare-throated tiger herons, parrots, valleys. The melodious blackbird It does have a very pretty call. And then we get into the motmots. They all have their own motmots. There's more than one kind. They have that interesting tail. They call it a banjo-shaped tail. It doesn't grow that way. The bird grooms it to look that way. And that's another bird call you can do. It pretty much goes mot, mot. Another rose-throated Picard. Can you see the bird? <laughs> Lower middle. The olivaceous honey creeper, or wood creeper, rather. Another yellow belly to Lania. Streak saltators. If you're into bird watching, it's the only saltator that has streaks. An oropendula. The oropendula builds a nest that looks like the oriole nest. It's a big ball that hangs down from the tree. And there are some varieties. That's Montezumas. And these are communal birds. So those are the nests. There are multiple openings. Only one is real. It keeps the predators out. And there's usually one dominant male that fathers almost all of the baby birds from that particular area. And they do have a whole ritual of bowing and jumping around to get together. That's the chestnut-headed one. And this one probably looks exactly the same, but it's not. It's the crested oropendula moving up from Panama. And if you want to try to tell the difference, you can see the crested one's a bit smaller than the chestnut-headed one. And that little circle I have in the lower right between Panama and Costa Rica, that's where you would find the crested. Swallowtail kites. Tropical kingbird, which is the most common bird that you will see. But if you find one in Florida, people will follow it everywhere because they're very rare here. They're becoming more common, I think. Another social flycatcher. This is a rare one, the seed eater. Pretty trees and some butterflies, just to run through them, because I think they're pretty. That was the best I could do for a turquoise Cotinga. They come in all sorts of beautiful colors. Lots of fast-moving streams where you'll find the torrent Taranulet, a cute little thing. That's about the size of a chickadee. A lot of people are growing ferns. In fact, Costa Rica exports ferns. And some of the birds that we see up here later on in the year, chestnut-sided warblers are down there. Much, much different coloration. That's what they look like when they're up here. 
Wilson's warbler, we have them up here. They migrate down there. Wilson was from New Jersey. Golden-winged warblers are in danger of becoming extinct, but down there you, you are going to catch them because they're in a smaller area when they migrate down there. If you're into the whole thing of looking at genus and species, this will be in the same uh, category as the blue-winged warbler, and it may be the same bird. Not a bird, flowers, a turtle, and the end. <laughs> Any other questions that I can answer other than beak and bill questions? But who are these birds, like, how do you find them? Because they don't all stay together in the same free area. That was some different breeds. Don't want to be next to the other breeds. I don't know. The, if you're out by yourself, you'll see a lot of birds. If you go with somebody, while you're talking to them, you'll see the birds over their shoulder and they'll see the birds over your shoulder. If you go with a group of three, four, or five people, somebody's always going to look at that. And if you go with a guide, you'll see probably 90% more than you would see if you were on your own. It's amazing when you're in your home territory what you actually can see. So when I'm up here, I, I see lots of things, and Kathy goes, I don't see it. But, you know, I, I go look around, and we do see it. And... Uh, it just becomes second nature if you're looking for it. But there are specific areas where you will find things. The hummingbirds, for example, I know when the trees are fruiting, that's where I want to be, that's where I want to see them. The trogons are going to be going after the berries. The oropendulas are always going to be flying over. So it's, you're, you're most likely going to see them. That flame-throated warbler, though, I've only seen two of those ever. So sometimes they're tough. The emerald tanager only saw one of those. Uh, I'd love to get some better pictures of some of the others, but uh, it's not always easy to do. So do you have to travel a lot through Costa Rica to find different types of birds? No, I'll probably only go to three or four places total on any trip. But depending on what you're looking for, the birds are different at different altitudes. So if I want to see the Quetzal, I'm going to be up very high. And that's also where the red starts are going to be and the toucanets. Uh, if I want to see the melodious blackbird, I'm going to be down lower uh, in undergrowth and some wetter areas. You'll see swallows just about everywhere. The hawks are just about everywhere. But it's all an altitude thing as to where you find things. Part of the problem with climate change right now, as things get warmer, the birds seek the altitude that's going to give them the temperature qualities that they're looking for. But when you go up a mountain, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So they're finding that their habitat is going away. And that's a bit of a problem. Yes? Do these birds have any kind of migration pattern? The, uh, for the answer is yes. The, the uh, warblers that I showed you will come back up to the United States and go elsewhere. Lots of these birds are migratory. The, the black crown night herons are migratory. The yellow crowned ones are migratory. But a lot of them are comfortable right where they are. And again, with climate change, things are changing. You'll notice that 20 years ago, we never saw a robin up here in the winter. And now they're all over the place all winter long. So things are changing, but they do migrate. There are some that don't. They have no reason to. Uh, and there are some that are just stopping there on their way further, much further south. So, yeah? What camera are you using? I've got two different cameras that I use, the Nikon D800 and the Nikon D850. I own two D800s because I dropped one and broke it. And when I smashed it beyond repair, I bought another one. And then I got a phone call from Best Buy saying, did you want to renew your contract? And I go, what contract? Well, you signed a contract and you paid money. Well, we'll replace a camera if it breaks for any reason, including you dropping it. So they, now I have two of those. It's not, it, the camera's important, of course, but the lens, I'm using a Nikon 200 to 500, which I really like, and sometimes I'm using a 300 millimeter 2.8 with a 2X on it, so it's a 600 millimeter 5.6, but it's too heavy to carry. Nobody else cares about that. Yes, Lucy? Do you usually go to bird sanctuaries? Or do you usually have a guide? 
I try to have a guide. The whole country is a bird sanctuary. I mean, they do a lot of things on a country basis there. For example, I was at one place and I, I noticed people outside smoking. And I said to the manager there, why don't you just set aside a place for the smokers to go so they're not wandering around? And the guy said, well, you might not be aware of this, but the country is outlawed smoking. If you want to smoke, you can do it in your own home. That's it. There's no other legal place to smoke in the country. So they, they do things in a big way sometimes. Sometimes they lead the way. There was a bird that you showed with hermit in its name. and Long-billed. What is it? Long-billed hermit. Okay. Did it get its name because the uh, one section of the bird looked uh, like, they looked like hermit crabs? I know where the long bill came from, but a lot of the names are the first person who saw it gave it a name. I don't know where hermit came from, but uh, you know, Wilson has named a lot of birds. A lot of other people have as well. Okay. So, to me, they reminded me of those little tiny hermit crabs that you used to buy at the shore and and they used to kind of crawl along the uh, tables or desks. I, of all the trips I've taken to Costa Rica, I never have actually seen the ocean. Huh. I'm always in swamps or on tops of mountains, so I've never really seen any of that stuff. Though, I did recently in Trinidad see a hawk fly down and grab a crab and bring it back up to the tree to eat. <laughs> so, a lot of nature. I don't want to go longer than I'm supposed to, but... What are the same birds have different coloration on different islands and different places? Again, the answer comes back to it has something to do with food or sex. With some exceptions. A number of birds will have coloration which is completely dependent upon the crustaceans that they eat. So, like flamingos, for example. You'll see different sh shades and variations, but the coloration has got a lot to do with what they're eating. I almost always kid around by saying the answer is always food or sex, and it isn't. There is an element of play, and a lot of these birds will get better at what they do, and ravens, for example, you'll, file, you'll find them taunting hawks, and then they do a ballet with them in the air. They mimic every single move, and the hawk will go after them and never get closer than two or three feet. And it's beautiful to watch the ballet, and that's more play than anything else. Yes? Um, do people put nets in the trees to trap birds? You won't find that as it, something in Costa Rica to trap the bird to eat them. You will find a few places where they put up mist nets just the way they do here in New Jersey. And they will capture a lot of birds in the morning. They'll ban them and release them immediately. So the answer is yes, they do some of that. There are some biological stations and places like that for doing it so that you can track them. So hopefully you can make sure that when you know where they're going, you can keep people out for the most part. Have you ever tried to um, record any of the bird songs? I have. I'm not very good at it because I don't have an ear for this at all. I feel that I'm very acoustically deficient. I'm amazed at the people that can do it. But uh, there are some people that we've had at the bird club that actually specialize in just bird calls. I think they're interesting, but when they look at the mimics, like our mockingbirds and the other birds that mimic other birds, they will take the bird call and dissect it. And this piece came from this bird, and this piece is another bird. They might be using 11 different bird calls all at once. And one year up at the Hawk Watch, we had a young woman who was doing the bird counting. And in the morning, it's quiet and you're all alone. And we had a mockingbird that would come up right behind her and imitate a car alarm. And every single time, scared her to death. <laughs> but they're very good at that stuff. Thank you so much. I think I'm done. <laughs> okay. Thank you for having us.